Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. There we go. All right. So my name is Jasmine Augusto, and I'm the Education and Community Outreach Manager for the Hartford History Center at Hartford Public Library. On behalf of the library and the Hartford History Center team, we welcome you to this year's Butch Lewis Community Conversation with special guest Shirley Sherrod. As some of you may know, the late Butch Lewis, co-founder of Hartford's Black Panther Party and longtime community organizer, tasked the Hartford History Center with making publicly available 24 videos that capture a significant moment in Hartford's history. The year was 1969, just after North End riots took place and there were crucial discussions happening around challenges in community police relations, education, housing, urban renewal, employment, and community life, particularly in Hartford's North End, Puerto Rican, African American, and West Indian communities. We are proud to share that this rich resource is available to you on the Hartford History Center's digital repository, which can be found online through the Hartford Public Library's website. And we invite you to take a look, it is incredible. We understand that Butch Lewis was passionate about having all people have a seat at the table, and that our guest this evening shares this vision from her work on the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the Civil Rights Movement, to her work in developing a cooperative farm in Georgia, to her work around rural development through the USDA and beyond. We would like to thank the Hartford Community Loan Fund, Voices of Women of Color, LLC, and the family and friends of Butch Lewis for putting this event together. And on behalf of the Hartford Public Library, we are proud to be your community partner. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Rex Fowler, CEO of the Hartford Community Loan Fund, who will set the stage for this evening's program. Thank you. My name is JC McCauley. I'm Naisha McCauley, and, and you're, you're watching, watching AccessTV.org. Thank you, Jasmine, and thanks everyone for being here. Especially, I appreciate folks who uh, made a change in your plans. Maybe um, if you were planning to hear Shirley last night, um, we know uh, you know sometimes flights just don't always work the way you want them to, and Shirley wasn't able to get here on time, so she was gracious enough to. Uh, stick around tonight. Uh, we just finished a great panel discussion on community land trust at the Wilson Gray YMCA in the North End, and Shirley was um, kind enough to allow us to spend some time with her here tonight. Um, as Jasmine said, uh, I'm Rex Fowler from the Hartford Community Loan Fund. Um, part of the reason, a big part of the reason why I'm here tonight is I was also a neighbor of Butch Lewis uh, in the North End on Vine Street, and Butch was also became, um, Butch became a, a mentor to me in the North End, and many a time I would um, call Butch up when I'd have a hard time figuring out this or that in the neighborhood, and I'd call Butch and just say, hey, what are you doing for lunch today? Can I buy us sandwiches, and can we go sit on your porch and talk things out? And uh, there were a lot of conversations Butch had on that porch that he had on Vine Street with all kinds of people from all over the city. And when Butch passed in September of 2015, uh, his family and the Lone Fund and the Voices of Women of Color wanted to try to resurrect that spirit, keep that spirit going that Butch had created of bringing people around together and talking through tough issues, especially when it came to his community, the North End of Hartford. Butch was really, really passionate about residents and had a deep love for his community. And that's one thing I think, one of a few things that he has in common with uh, Shirley Sherrod uh, as I got to spend some time with Shirley last night when her plane finally got in, we got to talk for a couple hours, a couple hours over dinner, and um, she reminded me a lot of, of Butch's spirit and his passion for what happens in the community and for the community to drive development and the, the activities that take place in a neighborhood, especially neighborhoods like the North End of Hartford. So I think, I, I can't think of a better person we could have to kind of embody the spirit of Butch talking with us tonight than, than Shirley Sherrod. Um, Shirley, uh, most folks know, became very famous in 2010 
when she uh, was forced to resign from her job as Georgia State Director of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, she was essentially framed uh, by um, uh, right-wing news media and um, the White House administration uh, reacted a little, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Prematurely, Prematurely right. <laughs> Hastily, some would say stupidly, um, and forced Ms. Sherrod out of her position and you know, a few days later uh, quickly backtracked and realized they had done Ms. Sherrod wrong. Uh, but that is not an uncommon position for Mrs. Sherrod to be in. She has experienced injustice throughout her life, and the way she has responded to that, to me, is um, so encouraging and so inspiring. And the, her ability to respond in ways that um, kind of turn her back on an opportunity to hate and an opportunity to seek revenge but an opportunity to really love the community and even love her enemies, I think, is a testament to her faith and to her spirit. And so I think we're in for a real treat uh, tonight. Um, after Ms. Sherrod uh, speaks to us for a while, uh, Laura Settlemeyer is gonna join us. Um, Andrea Comer, who was originally gonna interview Ms. Sherrod, wasn't available to uh, move her schedule to be here tonight. So Laura Settlemeyer is the director of the city's uh, blight remediation team. She's been here for about two years now. She came here from Detroit. She's also the new chairperson of the Hartford Land Bank. Uh, the land bank itself is new, and there's some exciting things I think we're gonna be hearing about in the future uh, from the Hartford Land Bank and the way it's gonna hopefully interact uh, more deeply with the community. So Laura is gonna have a conversation uh, with Ms. Sherrod. Kind of, we're gonna kind of imagine this is Butch's front porch up here on the stage, and they're gonna have a conversation with each other. And then Laura's gonna open it up to questions from the audience, so if you hear Ms. Sherrod talking about something and you wanna kinda of come back to that or it kinda of provokes a question that you have for her, then kinda of keep that in your mind or write, jot it down on a piece of paper, and then at the end of our time together, um, Laura will open it up and we'll let you ask some questions of Mrs. Sherrod. Following that, um, uh, the family, some family members of uh, Butch um, we'll close this out, and then Ms. Sherrod will be back at the back table um, where she can sign books. Uh, the Yukon Bookstore was kind enough to join us tonight, and um, they'll be able to uh, sell you a copy of Ms. Sherrod's book. I've read it, uh, I know Lars read it too, and it, it's a phenomenal read. If all you know about Ms. Sherrod is what happened in 2010, boy, you are missing 99% of this woman's legacy. She has a powerful journey. And she shares a lot of that in the, in the book. So I'd really encourage you to pick up a copy of the book. I know the library also has copies here you can check out. We wouldn't be able to do this tonight without some um, wonderful sponsors. So I want to just thank um, sponsors. You know, a lot of times when you do events like this, um, they have these gold, silver, bronze sponsors. You know, we kind of marketed this when we we're trying to get sponsors to, to help us financially with this. Um, so that's the way we kind of marketed it. But you know, that wouldn't really go for Butch. Um, so Butch, if, if you know Butch at all, um, when, whenever you'd say goodbye to Butch, Butch would never say goodbye back to you. He'd, he'd always have one response to you, and it was one love. Always Butch would be saying one love, one love. So um, tonight, uh, we want to thank our, our one love sponsors, our Community Solutions, Hartford History Center, Community Partners in Action, Hartford Listens, which is uh, Richard Frieder, who's here as a consultant, is behind Hartford Listens, and Richard's been instrumental in helping us organize this for the last three years. So I really want to uh, give thanks to Richard, too. And the YMCA, those are our One Love sponsors. Our Double Love sponsors, <laughs> Syncap Credit Union, uh, the Catal Center for Health Equity and Justice, the Yukon Humanities Institute, and Liberty Bank. And last but not least, Triple Love sponsors. United Bank uh, Foundation of Connecticut, the Betty Knox Foundation, and Key Bank. Let's just give a round of applause to all our sponsors. We wouldn't be able to do this without their support. All right, um, so I think that's all my announcements. 
Um, again, I want to thank also um, Voices of Women of Color. Uh, they've been instrumental in helping us to organize this to uh, so thanks to Janice Fleming and her team from Voices. Uh, to lead us into Ms. Sherrod talking, um, we thought we'd uh, refresh your memory if you're not familiar with the incident in 2010. Uh, we'll let Diane Sawyer and Jake Tapper uh, share that memory with you. Hello. My name is Destiny King. I am a member of the Hartford Communities That Care Youth Leadership Academy and the Young, Educated, and Determined to Succeed program. Over the past 27 weeks, I have been examining the intersections between education, poverty, violence, and trauma to develop policy and program recommendations. I served on a poverty work group and the following as our recommendations. Organize resources to support entrepreneurs. Expand efforts to provide highly qualified mentors for teens. To place priority on investments in affordable, high quality childcare and early education. Focus on giving people the tools to start new enterprises that will improve their circumstances and spur economic growth, as well as removing barriers to small business growth. Repair and strengthen the safety net to make sure there are safeguards in place that apply equally to all people. Reduce the large gaps between the very rich and the rest of society and make it easier for people to get into the middle class. Also, to address the gaps that persist for African Americans in educational attainment, employment, wages and income, family wealth and home ownership, health and infant mortality, and incarceration. Thank you for your time and I hope you can support our recommendations. seen that one. <laughs> there were so many from, from that week. Um, I grew up, and, and those of you who are here, you have to Google Baker County, Georgia at some point and just read about it. Um, no, there were two sheriffs that had a history um, that was not good in Baker County. One of them um, did something that impacts us today. Um, his name was Claude Screws. You can look up the case Screws versus the U.S. government. He lynched a black relative of ours by the name of Bobby Hall. And um, he tried to say Bobby Hall had a gun, I think, or something. The truth is that he, Bobby Hall, and the sheriff were going with the same black woman. Uh, that's what really led to his death. Anyway, an all-white federal jury convicted the sheriff not of murdering Bobby Hall, but of depriving him of his civil rights. And that case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, because he appealed the conviction, where it was overturned. The, the uh, justice who wrote the opinion said, in order for you to find the sheriff guilty, you had to prove that as he was murdering Bobby Hall, he was thinking about murdering him. So the whole issue of proven intent, you heard about it a lot when uh, Rodney King was beaten. The whole issue of proven intent came from that case out of Baker County, Screws versus the U.S. government. So I grew up in a in a county where the next sheriff had a speed trap so tight that you couldn't ride through the county without, being, without having to pay. And a black person could lose his life, his or her life, um, due to, and to get this, he didn't want to be called Sheriff Johnson. He wanted to be called the Gator, as an alligator. 
So he made a sound like an alligator that could just about make the hair stand up on your head. So growing up in that and going to segregated schools and, and having to deal with white people who were constantly trying to put us in our place, I made the decision as I grew up on a farm now. <laughs> uh, we actually owned our land. But I made the decision as I was picking cotton and doing the other work on the farm that I was not going to live my life on a farm and definitely not in the South. I had decided I didn't want to have anything to do with agriculture beyond high school. I thought maybe coming home from college during the summer, my father would make me get out in the fields and work again. But once college was over, I was heading north where I thought people were free. You know, folks would come home, and now I know those were rental cars they were coming home in. <laughs> you know, they looked so prosperous. Now, they would go back with all kind of meat and vegetables, <laughs> but, you know, they talked a good game, and I thought it was a true game. So um, I had decided after high school I would um, go to college, not in the South, in the north, because those of you who are, I'm 70, so those of, you, those of you who are older like I am knew that you probably was going to find your husband on the college campus. So I didn't want to take a chance on marrying anybody from the south. That's why I wanted to go to school in the north. <laughs> but you could never say what you'll never do. Um, my, father, my father's life was taken at a time when he was about as happy as he could be. I was going to graduate from high school in June of 65. He had convinced my mother to try one more time for this son. They had five girls. Every time, I mean, they kept having them because he thought he would have a son. So finally they stopped having them after five. And my youngest sister was eight. Um, my mother stayed sick. You know, one day my best friend at school asked me, how's your mom? I said, she doesn't seem to be getting any better. She said, girl, your daddy was at the store yesterday giving out cigars. Your mama going to have a baby. <laughs> he told everybody, this is the boy. He was having a new home built with five girls. He's having one room built just for this boy. It had to be blue, you know, and he was, we, he, picked, he and my mother picked me up from school one day to go with them to select the furniture for, the, for his boy's room. But my father didn't live to see my brother's birth. He was murdered. He died on March 25th, 1965. And my mother was seven months pregnant at the time. Um, I felt as the oldest, I needed to respond to what happened. You know, so many black people had been killed in Baker County, and now my father, who was a leader in the community, was dead. And that night, as people came to our home to help comfort us, I just didn't want to talk to anybody. I wanted to be by myself. So I went in one of the, in the girl's bedroom because he was having the girl's room and then this one boy that he didn't know whether it was a boy or not. But anyway, um, I can remember there was a full moon and you could still see the foundation because they hadn't smoothed all of that out around the house. My father only got a chance to live in the house one week before he was killed. And I was just praying and asking God to help me come up with an answer. I needed to do something. I felt as the oldest I had to do something. And while praying and asking for help to deal with this, the thought came to my mind. And I just believe it was God speaking to me. You can give up your dream of living in the North you can stay in the South, 
and devote your life to working for change. Now, the civil rights movement had been going on in Albany since 1961. This was 1965. We had supported that movement by raising money and by um, not shopping in Albany. So I can't say it was because I thought I would be able to do this through the civil rights movement. But I was obedient. I knew I had made a decision for moving forward. Didn't know what or how I would do it. Um, my brother was born on the day I graduated from high school. So my father was right. He told everyone it was the son, the son he didn't get to see. Um, I had an aunt who was uh, a principal of a school in Atlanta, and they were having a pilot upward bound program. And she just insisted that I come to Atlanta to be a part of that. It was at Clark College. It's now Clark Atlanta University. Um, so I had to go to Atlanta. And uh, the movement, Charles Sherrod and others from SNCC came into Baker County while I was in Atlanta. So I'm getting all these letters from my sisters talking about this person, Charles Sherrod. I went home for the 4th of July, and I went to my first mass meeting. I could just sit, I sat there crying because I saw people living on plantations who, should, who had every reason to be afraid of participating in the movement, but they were there. It was like these folk had decided that no more, we're not taken anymore. And, I, and then I looked at how Charles Sherrod, we tease each other now, um, he had really made these, helped these people see that working together we can force the change. So he told me that he had canvassed that and, at, at our house, met my sisters, and they told him they had another sister. And as he asked to see a picture, it was my picture. And he told them, I'm going to marry that girl. I lasted another year and some months. <laughs> but I tell him all the time now, when I saw what he, what he had done with people who had every right to be afraid, the gator had killed a number of black people. And he would, just, he, he would just go and kick your door in for no reason, you know. He was just such a mean person. But Charles Sherrod had been successful with actually getting people to make a decision to fight the system. Before that summer was over, we had actually gotten an injunction against the sheriff. The speed trap ended up stopping. Um, there would, I could go on and on about that summer and how I knew by the end of that summer that this was a way I could live true to the commitment I made. People get on me now, you know, why you don't have, even my husband at one point would say to me, you don't have to work so hard, but yes, I do, you know, and I'm still working. I just, it's, it's my work came not from any money because Lord knows that wasn't there. There were times when we, we, whatever little money we made, we put into a common treasury so we could pay the rent and utility bills and a little food for everybody else. And sometimes you didn't even have the food, but we stayed committed to, to bringing change in um, Baker County. So the summer of 68, I was just starting a pregnancy with our daughter. And uh, one Saturday morning, we, we, um, we printed a newsletter. So all of the students who were there with us that summer, everybody went out into the city to distribute the newsletter. And um, one, one young boy, he, he hung around Sherrod and I, and uh, he stuttered really bad, but he was, acting as if he was our son. So he was with us most of the time. He come every day. Um, 
I heard some people come. It wasn't unusual to have white people come because a lot of the people working with us were white people from the north. I heard them asking Grady, where was Sherrod? And he was trying to tell them, but he, you know, so he's trying to tell them that they were out distributing a newsletter. They asked him to come go with them to look for him. And they were gone for about an hour, came back, and I heard them go, see, we had the office, and lots of students stayed in this big house in, in what we call Harlem in Albany. Um, anyway, they went in the back of the, of the house where the office was, and then they burst into the room where I was. And I was screaming at them to get out. Um, one of them started toward me and just stopped. And I don't know what made them leave, but they, they did. And as soon as Grady went out on the porch with them, when he came back, he went in the back and the house was on fire. So they had actually set the house on fire while they were there. And of course, you call the police and you know, you just go through the act because there's nothing any of them were ever going to do to us. But before the evening, before the day was over, I'd, we, I teased my husband about this. We had to gather whatever we could to, to go down into Baker County to my mother's house. And uh, about six miles out of Albany, we had a flat tire. All the old cars we had were, <laughs> were barely making it from one county to the next, but, but we, we canvassed and did what we had to do. Um, so my husband pulled on the side of the road. And now he's sitting there, you know, thinking. That's the way he was. I think I probably could have changed the tire quicker than he could. <laughs> so he's sitting there thinking. Then a truck pulled off the road right behind, parked right behind us. And these two white guys, you could tell they'd been drinking. And I'm thinking, they didn't get us today. So they're about to do it now. But they didn't recognize him. They changed the tire. <laughs> and we were on our way. There were many things that happened through the years like that to us. You'd get almost killed during the day or um, during the evening. And, and, um, and then someone would do something nice. Um, that's just what our life was like. like. My mother, 1976, decided she would run for a seat on the Board of Education. I was surprised. This young woman, we, 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 we'd tell her she was just like one of the girls. My father had six girls, not, not five, because she was one of them. <laughs> but anyway, she, she decided she would run for a seat on the Board of ed Education. And that year, the Gator decide, he decided he would retire and his son would become the next sheriff of Baker County. So we were having meetings and telling people, let this legacy with these Johnsons in. Don't put another Johnson in office. And of course, that word got back to the sheriff. So on the night of the day that we voted, um, a bunch of us, they were paper ballots. We were standing there in the courthouse watching them count the ballots. The gator came from a back room and passed right by us and spoke. But then he realized he had just spoken to Charles Sherrod. So he came back and said, I take that back. I didn't know who you were. Now he had a gun on him. And, um, my husband is standing like this, looking right in his eyes. He's staring right into my husband's eyes. We had our two kids were standing between us, and I was literally about to have a heart attack because the sheriff didn't care that others were around. He was known in situations like that to just pull a gun and shoot. So they are standing there staring at each other when someone went outside to get the sheriff's son. So the son came rushing in and grabbed his father by the arm and said, come on, daddy, just leave that alone. He had to literally pull him out of there. And 
my mother was elected. She became the first black elected official in Baker County. She served, <laughs> yeah. she served 36 years and we were saying, okay, mother, it's just time to let somebody younger and the superintendent, <laughs> Superintendent was begging us, please let her do four more years. But we said, no, it's just time now. And it was a bad mistake because getting her out of there, the Tea Party knew they had a way in. So with the 2012 election, she, um, she didn't run. The school board went from four blacks and one white to four whites and one black. And the community has been organizing ever since. We, they started, they, there were voting irregularities. They raised the money and took a bus up to meet with the state attorney general. He says, that's, um, that's a local matter. He wouldn't touch it. Um, we tried to recall, but the attorney for the school board had connections all the way up to Atlanta, even though we had all of the signatures and had done everything right couldn't make that work. Um, we, I, they raised money to hire a black lawyer from Albany who took their money and uh, didn't do anything. They, the, that new board got rid of all of the best uh, teachers in the system. None of them had ever gone to school after integration there. They all went to private schools. So their goal was to wreck the school system in uh, Baker County. So um, I spoke at Emory Law School and found Kathleen Cleaver there. Kathleen had been there 20, y'all know who I'm, Eldridge Cleaver's wife, Black Panther, you know. I was shocked that, that Kathleen was working at Emory Law School. So she, had, she and some of her students helped um, helped us to find a, a young white lawyer who, um, who did the work pro bono. What a blessing. You know, and he, I kept telling, when he came to the first meeting, because that group now, so the 2012 election, by February of 2013, the community started meeting every Monday night. They still meet every Monday night because they started working on education issues and other issues in the county. They monitor every county commission, board of education, city commission, board of elections, because they've been trying to change, close four of the five voting precincts in Baker County. Said it'll save $8,000. So there's always something to fight. Some of these things we worked on in 1965 before the Voting Rights Act passed, and here we are again working on some of these issues. But the, the young lawyer, was on his way to the meeting one Monday night to meet the community for the first time. And I told him, you know, I probably need to run back to Auburn and lead you here. He's like, no, I can find it. You know, people work, they depend on these GPSs, right? And I'm trying to tell him that when you cross the, the bridge, you need to take the first left. So we're there waiting and waiting. And finally he called, I think he was about 15 miles down the road. He had gone past because he's looking for a city. And you got two four-way stop signs. <laughs> you know, no traffic lights, but stop signs. So anyway, he, he was successful at getting them in to federal court. And um, they ended up having to pay some money, but kept up their, their work. One of the things I'm trying to get you to see, we worked on a lot of issues with the civil rights movement of the 60s. And a lot of that is coming right back around where we have to work on it now. And, um, and it's harder to get people organized. I mean, I, I, I talk about the Baker County group because I don't know, I've never worked with a group of people. They won't even miss, if, if a holiday is on Monday, they are gonna meet on Tuesday. So every week, since February of 2013, they have met and they work. They raise money. They do all kinds of stuff together. And it's just a prime example of what a community can do. I have another group in the same county who worked to save 
the school we attended. We moved into the school in 1957. Georgia's answer to the Brown decision was to build these separate but supposedly equal schools. They threw them up, you know, cinder block and, and concrete, <laughs> you know, but, but it was the best we had ever had. Before that, we had outdoor toilets. We were going to school in army barracks that had been placed facing each other, no top over the porch, but a porch built between them. So things were tough, but we got this new building and we played basketball on dirt courts. But I can tell you, we excelled in just about this little country. These country kids worked hard. The city kids didn't beat us on anything. But it was good to have um, hot lunches and indoor toilets. We appreciated it, even though it wasn't the best. So when the school system made a decision to build a new school, I, we still have school reunions, Newton Colored School, you know, all the names that we've had through the years. And the oldest person who comes graduated in 1937. And he's still attending the, the reunions. So um, anyway, they saved the, the school. And in that school now, it's Head Start, in that building is Head Start. Uh, there's a USDA certified commercial kitchen that we organized. A, a, there's a three state project that I helped to start with women in Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. Uh, we organized the um, worker owned sewing co op. It's called Southern Journeys with an S. You should look that up as well. Some beautiful products that they make uh, quilts, bags, you name it. Uh, but it's helping to provide jobs in the, in the rural area. Um, there were sewing factories everywhere, but you know that those factories have closed. So we knew we had women who knew how to sew. And that's what gave us the idea of, of or helping them to organize to start their own co-op. So my life has been busy with all of these various things. And uh, so when, when Clinton was elected, um, black folks down there decided I should be the state director for Farmers Home Administration. But they forgot one thing, and that was Sam Nunn. Sam Nunn was the senior Democrat from the state. He was a senator. And there was no way Sam Nunn was going to allow me to become state director of Farmers Home Administration. Um, I can remember that um, my name had gone over from the White House. And uh, he had decided one of the donors, one of his donors, a daughter of one of his donors would, would have that position. So that was a standoff, because I don't know whether you remember anything from Clinton early years, but Sam Nunn did support him when he was initially elected, so he couldn't get his appointments. Judges, state director, none of that. So I'm caught in the middle here. Um, so one day, Nunn's office called me. I was driving to Atlanta. They actually called our Atlanta office for the Federation and left word that, that I, I needed to call them. So when I got there and got the message, I called. They said, we are interviewing. We hear you want to become state director. We're, in, we're having interviews tomorrow. And uh, we've given you a slot of 1150, and it's the only one we have. Now, I had driven to Atlanta to sit, sit in a meeting until 8, and I was going back home. I actually went back home, and y'all know black folks have to get their hair right, right? <laughs> so I sat in that meeting until 8, but I called my husband, and, and I told him, call my beautician, and tell him he got to do my hair tonight. <laughs> so I got to his shop at 11 o'clock that night, <laughs> and then the next morning I was in Atlanta at Nunn's office for, for the appointed time. And they asked me, you know, things like, um, do you have any children? And I guess they thought my children were really young. I said, yes, I do. Uh, 
where are they and what are they doing? I said, my daughter just graduated from Clark Atlanta University with a master's and she's working as, as a counselor at Mitchell Baker High School currently. And my son is in his third year of engineering at Tuskegee, but he's on assignment at the Southern Company in Birmingham. So they left that alone. <laughs> and then, um, well, do you have any problems with, well, the other thing they tried, see, they, one of the things I had to do as an organizer was learn more about the programs at USDA than the people they had working in those offices. So I went in there, you know, my hair was done, I'm dressed, and I know there ain't nothing you can ask me today about agriculture that I can't answer. And they saw that right away. That's, that, that's why they started the personal stuff. Um, you have any problems with the Internal Revenue Service? No, I don't. What about others in your family? I said, I wouldn't know. I've never asked. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, they went down that line a little and then, and then it was over. Um, what they didn't know is that I had been selected as a fellow in the Kellogg National Fellowship Program. And my first thought was, well, if they, if they give me the position of state director, I'm gonna have to give up the fellowship because no black person had ever been in, those, in that position. But then Kellogg brought us together for a week. I'd go back to my room and pinch myself and say, is this real? You know, they are gonna do all this for me? There ain't no way I'm giving it up. But I played the game until September with the position in the Clinton administration. Um, I think it was September the 25th that NAFTA passed. And the next day, Nunn got all of his appointments. So I didn't get the position of state director because of that. Nunn voted for NAFTA and he got everything he had been asking for. So you fast forward to the Obama administration four years later, and here they are coming again saying, you know, we've still, we still have not had a black person, you gotta do it. And I'm thinking, I'm four years older. Do y'all understand that? It's time for me to be sitting down. But I said, okay. Um, I didn't hear anything. I didn't know what was happening with it. So, if you remember, I told you July 8th, we heard that we had been successful with our claim in the Pickford case, New Communities. And New Communities had been awarded between 12 and $13 million. So when they called me um, to say I had been selected to be state director of rural development, I got quiet. The guy, he was calling from the White House. He said, you're still gonna do it, aren't you? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm already thinking, but I got to move to Athens. You know, my mind had gone way past just being told. I knew what it was going to take, because so, if, I, uh, if I accept work to do, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do the very best job I can. So that meant not, I couldn't, there was no way I could live in Albany and do that. I had to go and find an apartment in, uh, in Athens. And... Um, so I didn't tell them about New Communities Award. It should not have had any impact on that position, but I did go to my congressman to tell him. And he said it shouldn't have anything to do with it. And um, anyway, he, um, he told me, though, I had to disassociate myself from the New Communities Project. And then he told me that my husband should do so also. I said, well, that'll be the end of the appointment because there ain't no way. This is our life's work. You know, yeah, I'll step back, but I know he won't. And uh, so that's how I ended up as State Director of Rural Development. And just like everything else I've done all of my life, there's one thing I know, I know rural. And I know the needs of people in the rural because that's where I've spent my life working. So I, oh, I, there's something else I just have to tell you, and I'm gonna hurry up and end this. Um, they reorganized USDA in 1996. Everything was on the farmer's home before that. 
But when Mike Espy, the first and only black uh, Secretary of Ag, was there, one of the things he did was the reorganization. So those working for the agency had a chance to go to rural development or stay with Farmer's Home. So all these people, most of these people there were folks I've had to jump on, get on, deal with them on behalf of black farmers. Because they were doing the wrong thing. And, and so who else did the farmers have but me and the staff that I had? So you had to jump in there and do what you had to do. So when I get there, there are all these folks. You know, these are the staff. New Rural Development had about 127 employees, only about 20 of them statewide was black. So I told them, that those in the state office, I said, um, I want you to know I'm not here to settle any scores. I said, if I don't do but two things while I'm here, I want to make sure I do them. That's to let people of this state know the programs of this agency and know that they have equal access. I said, that's what I'm about. They were not doing any outreach, none at all. I targeted the nine poorest counties in the state. I used seven, uh, a 20,000 median household income, and there were nine that met that. So I, they, they had to do outreach. In fact, after I was asked to leave, I got this note from Cheryl Cook saying, we were wondering why they would pick you, why they were after you. They said, you were able to get three times more money into persistently poor counties in Georgia than they had done the previous eight years. Now, the secretary wanted to know how I did it. Now, I led him on. You saw them say I had to think about the position. I knew from day one I wasn't taking that position. You know, there was no way I would have gone back to work for USDA. They didn't offer, now, yes, there was one way I would have gone. They didn't offer me my same job. They offered a position in D.C. I was not interested in working from D.C. And then he had the nerve to say to me, well, you could choose one of the other offices in the state to work from. I knew that that was designed for failure. I think all they wanted to do was keep me where they could keep their hands on me. So when I, I waited a whole month, they were begging me to come earlier for the talk with him about the job. I wouldn't do it. So I, when I finally went up, um, Y'all should have seen, they had me in this fancy hotel the night before. And then they sent those black SUVs, three of them, to pick me up. And we went under the building. I didn't even know all that was there to get to, get to his office. And um, anyway, I told him I wasn't taking the job. He thought he could talk me into it. And I just kept telling him, no, no, there's no way. You know, had they given me my position in Georgia, I, would have, I, I probably would have gone back because I had gotten some things started that I knew would make a difference for people in the rural area. But now you're taking me out of that and putting me somewhere in a, in a position. It was deputy director of the Office of Outreach, and there were all kind of problems with that office. So why would I? I wasn't any fool, you know. I guess they thought so. I think they wanted to get me in a position where they could just quietly fire me. That's what I think was trying to happen. Anyway, um, after he saw I wasn't coming back, then he wanted to know how I did what I did. He even had people calling me over the next few weeks, and I would say, that's my work. And then it done. he was trying to start his own initiative called Strike Force. And he wanted to see how I did what I did so he could use that as his model without telling me, you know. But anyway, he later, I think it was, it was before he left. I was in an audience and he asked me to stand, an audience of county commissioners across the, the county, the country, and he told them that um, the strike force work uh, came from my work. So he finally gave me credit for what was happening. But anyway, I think I've probably used my 20 minutes, is it? Because I can go on. Y'all know after 53 years, I got some kind of stories. <laughs> okay. Okay.
Hello, I'm Jay Stan McCauley and I'm exploring a run for mayor of the city of Hartford in the 2019 election. It's undeniable that Hartford has many challenges. However, I believe that our residents are our strength. The question is, do you believe like I do in the potential of Hartford? You see the many assets the city has, but do you wonder, as I do, why we are still struggling to move ahead? Do you wonder why the solutions being offered to us just don't seem to get the job done? Well, creating a vibrant city begins with you. We have incredible people who live in the city, who have great solutions to Hartford's biggest challenges. But you don't always have a platform to have your ideas heard let alone given an opportunity to co-create solutions that work for you, that work for us, that work for Hartford. Hartford's journey will be bumpy and we'll continue to face highs and lows that challenge us to work smarter and come together as a community that is willing to capitalize on the power of our collective diversity of thought. The challenges facing Hartford will require each of us to act, whether in small ways or big ones. If you're with us on this journey, give me a call at 860-944-9797 and host a listening event for me. Invite a few of your friends so we can explore the possibilities together for a better Hartford. you started why you started new communities yeah we new communities we were organizing that in the rural area and um, we were recruiting people to integrate the schools or or to register to vote and um, those who were living on plantations of farms owned by white people in just about every case would be asked to leave the farm just because they were participating in the movement. They come to the mass meeting, and, um, and here we have yet another family. We've got to help find a place for them to live or, you know, a job. Um, so from that, the whole idea of trying to build the community came up. And uh, during the summer of 1968, we had officially seven, but one person took his wife, so eight actually traveled to Israel to, to look at how Israel was resettling its people. And uh, so they, they, they studied the, the um, kibbutz and the moshavim, and I can't remember all of the communities that they had, and came back with that information so that we could discuss it and make a decision to try to move forward with new communities. Now, while we were doing all this, one of the members was, he was the only black real estate agent and only black insurance uh, broker uh, south of Macon, maybe even south of Atlanta. So Slater knew that, that um, this place, Featherfield Farm, was on the market. And uh, we immediately moved to put an option. Featherfield Farm was 4,800 acres more or less. And once we put the option on that farm, then we had another farmer, who, a white farmer, who wanted to sell 935 acres. So we pulled that in. We, it was officially 5,735 acres, but unofficially 6,000 acres, because they were tax taxing us on 6,500 acres. You know, so that's how we got the initial start with with um, the land that was purchased. Um, well, it wasn't. We had option on it. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, 
Um, but y'all, I can tell you, once it was common knowledge that, that we had the option on that property, white people started shooting at buildings with us in them. They started doing all kinds of stuff to, to run us off the land. And the major thing they did, we, we got a planning grant from the Office of Economic Opportunity, but um, they um, blocked the major grant we were supposed to get to help with starting and building the community. They blocked um, that funding. Lester Maddox, you may have heard of, he was a Georgia governor, but he was a restaurant owner. And he used axe handle to run black people out of his uh, restaurant and used that to propel himself into the governorship. He, um, he um, vetoed all federal money coming to our project, which put us in a bad way for a couple of years because Prudential Insurance held the first mortgage on the 4,800 acres and they moved to foreclose a couple of times and we fought that off and finally got better financing somewhere around 1972, 73 and started farming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you share the story of uh, when you were driving in Alabama and realized you possibly had a claim to join the, yeah. the Pickford case? <laughs> yeah, you know, I was so focused on the farmers I've been working with. Um, and I can tell you with the black farmers lawsuit, there were no newspaper ads or radio ads or TV ads. The helping farmers to get that information had to be done by the organizations that were working with them. So at one point I flew out to Texas trying to help farmers because there were specific things they needed together in order to file a claim. And the, the lawyers, the judge gave two classes, A and B. A, you didn't have to use much evidence of discrimination. You just used one incident. You were supposed to be then eligible to get 50,000. The government was supposed to pay 12, five as taxes on the 50, and you were supposed to be able to get your debt written off. It just didn't happen that way. You know, farmers, you know, being told that the 12-5 was taxes on the 50, didn't claim that on their taxes, and some of them are still dealing with problems from that. Mm -hmm. The other was claim, the B claim, you had more evidence of discrimination, and you had to get an economist and all, and your award could be as big as what the economist could help come up with. Um, but I'm so focused on everybody else, and riding along late at night, um, thinking about the farmers, and then just like, you know, just like the night when I made the decision to stay and fight, I thought, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. We were farming. You had to have dis experienced the discrimination between 1981 and 1996. Why? Because when Reagan became the president, he abolished the Office of Civil Rights at USDA. So when black farmers complained, the complaint didn't go anywhere. So the statute of limitation, you had to deal with that because it's usually just two years, and Congress took it back to when uh, Reagan abolished the Office of Civil Rights. So we were actually farming in 1981. And it took a long time, even when cell phones were a little more available for me to get one, <laughs> but I really didn't have anything and had to do all that thinking all of it for another two and a half hours to get home. <laughs> but uh, I rushed in the house and told my husband, we can file a claim in Pickford. You know, we still had three months to be able to, to file. But that's how we ended up getting the largest award uh, in the Pickford case. And we bought more land now. And it's not mine or my husband's. That thought never entered our minds. We are, we are about movement. We are about building communities. And so we knew mm -hmm. there would, wouldn't be any doubt that we would continue with the dream that we had. Shirley, one of uh, perhaps the most inspiring part of, of your story is, is your faith and your strength through all that you have been through, all the injustices that you faced and the tragedies you have seen firsthand, how, how do you not become hateful and resentful and discouraged? If I, if I <laughs> zeroed in on hating mm -hmm. or allowing that to get to me, I can't think straight. Mm -hmm. 
I can't look at what should be done, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm so focused on hating. Um, now, I won't tell you that some of those thoughts don't enter my mind sometimes, but I let them go. I have to let them go if I'm going to continue to try to build and, and help communities and help people who don't, you know, a lot of, you take housing with rural development. Folks don't know that that money is available because the people in those offices won't tell them. Mm -hmm. But here you had, and while I was state director, I know one office was particularly bad, treating people bad. I'm like, I know they are not doing that while I'm in charge here. <laughs> You know, so I went down and had a meeting with them, and they're going to tell me, well, you think they're doing that just because they're complaining just because you are here? No, it's what you're doing, <laughs> you know? So, so, I mean, on my watch, they're going to still do this stuff? Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, but you can get so consumed mm -hmm. with, with hate. You have to pray, let it go, because you have work to do. Mm. See, the NAACP condemned me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I remember, you, oh, y'all, that day when all that stuff was just in the news. I was way over in, in uh, West Point, Georgia, where the Kia plant had located, with part of my staff. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to tour the Kia plant that day, after our meeting, or during lunch. But then all this stuff, my secretary called me nearly in tears you know, with all of the hate calls that were coming into the office. It was awful. Anyway, I called to Washington for help. They wouldn't return my call. But finally, I couldn't go for the tour of the Kia plant with the rest of the staff because I'm waiting on a call from D.C. Mm -hmm. They went and toured the plant and, and came back. So about two hours, I'm still sitting there waiting on a call from D.C. to see how they are going to help me. I finally got the call. I told the staff to sit down so I could explain to them what was going on when they came back. And um, then I got the call. Mm -hmm. So I walked out of the room. And um, they told me they were putting me on administrative leave. So I said, so what do I do? Go home and have a good rest. That's what they said. <laughs> Now, I went back in the room and told the staff there, there were about 14 of them. I think three of us were black. I told them that, um, you know, I needed to get back to Athens. I, for once, I was in a government car. Most of the time, I was riding my own car because I didn't like the way that car drove. <laughs> anyway, um, they asked me to allow one of them to take me back. And I'm like, no, I can do this. Um, so anyway, uh, they asked, could we pray? And I said, yes. So we got in a circle and prayed. And uh, y'all have to know these folks really didn't want me there early on, but after 11 months, we had become a really good working team, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but anyway, I was 45 minutes into the trip and um, got the first call. Where are you? I said. This is a three and a half hour trip. And again, I'm trying to explain that I helped that farmer. We became good friends. Didn't want to listen. I was driving through Atlanta traffic around five something. And I got the next call. Where are you? And again, I said, you know, I'm just in Atlanta. Still had to go to Athens. And uh, again, I'm trying to explain, but they didn't want to hear anything I said. I was, there's a sign that says Athens is, I think the sign says 36 miles. I had just passed that when I got another call. Mm -hmm. And um, they, uh, I was told, well, I was told going through Atlanta that the White House wanted me to resign. I was asked after I passed that sign to pull to the side of the road and use my Blackberry to submit my letter of resignation. They were worried about Sean Hannity and the others. They wanted to be able to say I had resigned by the time the six o'clock news came on. So I told, and I'm thinking about the effect this is going to have on Obama's administration. All the world is caving in on me, and I'm worried about him, mm -hmm. you know, and what this was going to do to him. 
Um, but anyway, I sat on the side of the road and wrote the letter of resignation. And I went on to uh, Athens to turn that car in. I got my car, went by the apartment to get a few things, stopped at my secretary's house to give her everything I thought I had on me that the government had to have, my ID, keys, everything I had. And then I got on that road. She was begging me, please don't drive home tonight. But I said, no, nah, I got to get home. And uh, so I'm, I, a lot of my friends called me throughout the trip home because it's four hours. It took me four hours to drive home. Got home just after midnight and got a hate call. The next morning, every news truck you could think of was out there in our yard. The big satellite truck from CNN. You know, and uh, I think I did, I think that was Morning Joe where I did the first interview by phone. And then the lady um, from CNN asked me if I would be willing to do an interview with Tony Harris there from my house. I said, yeah. So I'm on this, doing this interview with him explaining when he said something, so I stopped talking. And he said, we have someone here. I didn't know who was coming on. The next voice I heard was the voice of the white farmer's wife. Now what they told me later, see that I, when I said we became good friends, we actually became mm -hmm. good friends. Mm -hmm. When I was working on his case, Roger would, we'd stop to eat somewhere and he'd take out that big thing of tobacco and get a chew <laughs> and then ask me, you want some? <laughs> you know, I'm like, no. <laughs> you know. They said their daughter-in-law saw me on TV and told her husband, who was their son, um, said, look. And he saw me and said, that's my mom and dad's friend. So he jumped in his truck and went to their house and said, you got to turn your TV on, your friend is on. So they started trying to get in the, a call through to CNN and actually did that while I was on the air. You know, Breitbart thought later that that had been staged. No, it was just God. <laughs> it was just God because I could have told that story forever and ever, and that would have been people who didn't believe me. But when they called in and they couldn't trip them up, when they told what I did, the story just started. It had started turning around that night because I actually talked to a young reporter from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution mm -hmm. after I arrived home. So that was the first turnaround, but it really turned around mm -hmm. after that. But the NAACP condemned me that first night. Right. And everybody's telling me about this article. And, um, and I'm like, what have they done? You know, being jealous, I had never met. He was like 30-some years old. And um, so they... By the end, of, before the end of the day that Tuesday, which was the next day, he was calling me. I thought if something was wrong with him, he's trying to read the statement and acted like he couldn't read. I'm like, what is this? But I think now, I know now he was very emotional. Mm -hmm. He didn't know what I would say, mm -hmm. you know, but he was trying, they were trying to apologize. So they wanted to come and, and look me in the eyes and say, I said, that's not necessary. I said, we have too much work to do to be upset with each other. We need to be more focused on the work because we got a lot to do. But they did come um, by the, within the next two weeks to sit down with me to say I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. can, you sh can you tell us about the call with President Obama? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in CNN. Before that Tuesday was over, the young lady from CNN said, will you come and go back to the headquarters with us? in Atlanta, and so I'm like, who wouldn't want to get rid of all that out there in my yard? <laughs> you know? So I said, okay. So I went and packed a uh, few things for, my, my, for me and my husband and got in the car with her. She kept saying they had ordered a car, but I just can't figure out what went wrong. She said, well, y'all mind riding in my car? Uh-uh, I don't mind riding in your car because I needed to get away from all the press there, and others were on the way. Anyway, we, we drove into Atlanta, but just before we got there, Roland Martin was on live. And she, they wanted me to comment. He was saying all these terrible things about him, about me. You know, she should have known better as a government official. Oh, he was saying, 
So I came, I, who are you and what have you done? You know, I just lit in on him. Cause what have you done to be able to say stuff like that? He didn't even, the facts were out there by then, but he wasn't, you know, he was blaming me for everything that had happened. So I was there, I did Anderson Cooper that night. I have to tell you about my husband. So they put us in this, this hotel, the mansion. I didn't even know a hotel like that existed. <laughs> Plush, oh my goodness. And said, y'all can order whatever you want. So I'm still getting all these phone calls. I look up, my husband had sea scallops this big. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, sure. <laughs> He said, they ain't paying us. <laughs> so so it, I did Anderson Cooper that night back, and the next morning they had me up at 5. This is Wednesday. And uh, so I'm doing all kind of interviews from there because I couldn't see. You know, they'd take me to this table with a chair, and I'm, I'm being interviewed by, uh, by Matt Lauer and others. Anyway, about 3 o'clock, the... Young lady said, My, Matt Lauer wants you to come to New York, but you didn't need to do that. And she walked away. Now that's a decision I need to make. That's right. So I called her back. And I said, I want to go to New York. Mm -hmm. So then CNN was no fool. They went and bought first class tickets for my husband. I one way tickets. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got there, a person from CNN was there, but we couldn't pull up to the gate right away. And I, my phone rang because I turned it back on. We sitting out there waiting to get up there. And it's Oprah's friend, Gail. Somebody had alerted her that I was coming to New York because she tried to act like she didn't know. I said, I'm sitting out here on this plane at LaGuardia. You in? You at LaGuardia? Oh, I need you to, you know, to do interviews and da da da. I said, so I gave her the girl's name from CNN. I said, she's handling the schedule. Um, so they had arranged for a lot of interviews the next day. I did all of the networks. And um, my husband was upset with me because his family reunion was going on in Richmond. And if I stayed to do the view, that meant he couldn't get back to Albany in time. But he and my daughter were going to the reunion. I wasn't going that year. I told the young lady, I said, get him on a plane back to Albany. I'm, go I'm doing the view. <laughs> so, so anyway, the, so I did all of those networks. And y'all, two reporters were about to fight over me out in, on the street. The police had to come over. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I just didn't know what to do. But anyway, after I did the view, on it, uh, Whoopi Goldberg, asked, you know, did the president call yet? Every reporter was asking me that, and he had not called. Mm -hmm. So I told her no, and I think she said a few choice things about him. Anyway, when we had to wait on the car to come back to pick us up, because I was going um, to the airport from there. And um, so the car came, and when you hear about paparazzi, they were trying to pull the doors open to that car when, we, when they opened the gate for us to go out. It's like, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. you know. But then my phone rang after we got past them, and it was John Lewis calling to check on me. And um, he, he told me how Vilsack had cried when he went in to talk to the, to Vilsack, the Secretary of Ag, to the uh, Black Caucus. And um, so when we hung up, I saw that I had a text message, and it was from the White House. Okay, so I called the number, and the young man said he needed to arrange a call with me and the president. So I had to make a decision. Do I take this call in this car, or do I wait till I get to the library? Y'all have to know that whole week, I hadn't been exposed to the public other than sitting in front of a screen on the TV. So I didn't have a clue as to how everybody took, was taking what had happened, whether people believed it or whatever. I didn't have a clue because I had, CNN had kept me with them. So um, I, had, I made a decision that I would take the call in the car, because I didn't know what I'd run into at the airport. I didn't know where at the airport I could have sat to have a call with the president. Right. So, um, 
So the first thing this young lady from CNN, CNN did was pull a camcorder out. Mm -hmm. I said, no, you will not take me when I'm talking to the president. I said, I don't mind giving you an interview when it's over, but you can't take me. Mm -hmm. So he gets on the phone, oh, you're a hard person to find. Now, everybody <laughs> in this country knew I had been with CNN all week. <laughs> but I let him get away with that one. <laughs> and, and then he said, um, all the issues you've been putting out there all week, I'm well aware of them. I said, but you don't understand them the way I do. So we went back and forth, back and forth. I'm saying you don't understand it. He's trying to tell me I should read his book, and I will see that he understands <laughs> And I'm not giving up. I forgot all about talking to a president of the United States. <laughs> So neither one of us were given, you know, right. but finally I said, you know what, you need to come to Southwest Georgia, mm -hmm. and when you come, bring your wife with you. Mm -hmm. So he said, um, he said, oh, Sanford, Sanford Bishop is the congressman from that district. He said, uh, oh, Sanford has been trying to get me to come down, and he led me to believe he might do it. And then he uh, told me, the young man who had called me said, keep his number if you ever need to talk to me. He can come into my office at any time. And that's how we left it. Now, did he say I'm sorry? No, he didn't. I, let, I told the press, by the mere fact that he called me, he tried to get in touch with me and talk to me, I took that as, as an apology. But he never said I'm sorry. Never. You know. Thank you, Shirley. Okay. So we're going to go to questions from the audience. Um, and just as a reminder, um, it, this is quite an honor, I know, to have Shirley Sherrod here with us tonight. And we all have many things we want to say to her. But if we can keep the questions to a question format for Shirley to answer for the rest of us, please keep that in mind. How does urban communities prevent the formation of food deserts within their neighborhoods? Now, that's a good one. <laughs> um, you can organize your own um, stores. You know, I, 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 I look at how close people live in the city and think, gosh, that's a, a good organizer can get in there and make some stuff happen because you don't have to mile, drive a mile to get to the next house and a mile to get to the next house. But really, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take the community, whatever community you can pull together uh, to deal with that. It's an issue in rural areas. Um, where I'm from, there is no grocery store. Um, there's a health department. Um, and that's not where I live now. I live in Albany. But there are food deserts in Albany as well. The poverty rate is about 37% in the city. And uh, we're constantly um, doing pop-up markets. We have been given. Uh, nearly 47,000 square foot Winn-Dixie store building where we're trying to locate a food hub. But you just have to keep work. Talk to, you know, you can, as I tell farmers and others when we're organizing, my sister and I put together a group. That's, that's the group that later dealt with the school system in the county. She saw some young boys with t-shirts alike and thought that some sort of gang activity was trying to start. So what did we do? We called six people together. We asked the principal if the meeting could be held at the school. He said yes. Then we talked about it and asked each of them to bring six to the next meeting. And we called it the community council. We worked on a lot of issues. And that's why things were ripe for this group when the school board uh, became four whites and one black. You know, that training we had done early on just fell right into place. Uh, and, and, uh issue that, that Butch Lewis was very involved in lately, and of course he had many involvements, was the, um, the grabbing away of homes and land from uh, citizens in, or non-citizens in urban areas. You know, it continues to this day. It was on the radio just this morning of how uh, banks and some so-called municipal leaders collude to um, steal people's homes and land. And I wonder if you had, again, I apologize if you've already addressed that, as to how in any city, especially a poor one like Hartford and some others, we can um, form some solidity to resist uh, the, the um, privatizing and the separation of citizens from their homes in the cities. 
And it's something you have to organize around. I'm sure Butch Lewis, sitting on that porch, talking to people. You know, it could start as simple as that mm -hmm. and can lead to something that would help with these situations that you face. With how we're still dealing with air property situations down with land in the South. Mm -hmm. You know, our four parents were told to leave it to the family. They didn't envision the day that the family might be 600 people, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe the land holding is only 50 acres. You know, I had a man in my office recently, and I'm the wrong one for him to come to with that. He just got out of prison or something, and he's gonna try to force the sale of the little land that they have in Mitchell County. And I told him, you're talking to the wrong person, because there'd be no way I would help you find a lawyer he want to force the sale. If the land doesn't mean anything to them, to him. And that happened a lot with people who left the South, went to the North, didn't quite make it there, and remembered they had some land mm -hmm. down there in the South. And they just want the money. And the other thing is they think the land is worth so much, and it's not. But just talking, talking to people can lead to trying to develop something, or if there's some organizations already doing it, trying to become a part of, of them to, to really do something about it. Hello again. Hi. Um, it's funny, the more I hear you talk in person, like the more my heart beats really fast. <laughs> um, I just, um, yeah, just, anyway, so I'm gonna try and get this out quickly. Um, but, you know, I, I guess we don't have to shy away from saying that a, our system is based on a lot of racist policy making, and it's very hard to get away from that. And a lot of your life's work is creating new systems that create equity, yes. and uh, and I applaud you for that. And you're doing such amazing work that you know a young person like me uh, finds, um, you know, it's what I hope to one day be able to like fall, you know, follow in your footsteps. And so, you know, what advice do you have to give for folks on the ground who are doing this work and we're forced to participate in these systems and sometimes they, you know, from funders to the people who hire us, like they mean well and uh, we wanna be able to do that good work. Um, but then, you know, it's hard to break that system. And then my second question is, if in this administration they would give you a political office, would you take it? <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, what advice I would give you is don't give up. You know, what if we had given up when the, that man, when they took the land and they dug holes and pushed our building? It could have been over then. It could have been over forever. Mm -hmm. But we didn't give up. And now look at what we have. You know, we have a prime piece of property that we're trying to do some, some, some good work with. Now, the Democratic, the State Democratic Party descended on me um, four years ago. Um, they had decided, um, when Jimmy Carter's grandson was running for governor, uh, Sam Nunn's daughter was running for the Senate seat. And they needed to bring the black vote in, so they had decided that I could do that in the state of Georgia. So this man called, and uh, I was driving to Atlanta, and he said he needed to come and talk with me. I said, well, I gave him the number to the office. I said, call and ask for Linda. Linda will find a time for you to come. I didn't think about that man again until the day Linda reminded me he was coming. So he walked in my office, and he said, um, do you know who I am? I said, no. He said, you didn't Google me to try to figure out? <laughs> I wanted to tell him I didn't even think about you again. <laughs> but I did, and that was nice. He said, I'm the recruiter, the, the recruiter for the State Democratic Party, and everywhere I've been, your name came up. So they had decided that I would run for Commission of Agriculture in Georgia, and I knew that was to try to get the black vote more energized for that election. I told him I can't. And um, I put my hand on the master plan for new communities that was on my desk, and I said, you see all of this? This ain't even half of the work, you know? But um, anyway, he left there, he, we went to lunch, and 
I told him the answer is no. Well, about two weeks later, the leadership of the State Democratic Party, about eight to 10 people, just descended on me. They had designed my signs, <laughs> you know. They had everything there, and they told me, um, you know, we have a list that you can work from, but you don't only need to raise about 300,000 from that list, and we gonna help bring all the, I said no. No and no. Do you understand? I have no desire to run for public office. They came back to me uh, when qual before qualifying for the, this year's election. It's four years later. I said no then and I said no now. I, have not, I do more work from where I am than I could holding a uh, political office. We have time for about one more question. Uh, thank you for everything and for being here. Uh, since you were primarily affected by Breitbart and Fox News, ever since then they have clearly escalated. There's so many other fringe groups that, that are targeting pretty much anyone who speaks truth to power, particularly black intellectuals. Uh, I know one of um, my alma maters, Professor uh, Johnny Williams, was recently kind of um, hit with them. How does one resist that? Um, both people who are being attacked on all sides by this propaganda machine, and, and how would we, as a society, battle that? Like, how do we stop it? It's, it's a cancer that's uh, in deep. Uh, what what do you, would you recommend? What they're doing is wrong, but you can't let that distract you from what you need to be doing. That's the way you have to look at it. Now, I, um, I sued Breitbart, and then, you know, I was at the, we always take some young women to the UN during the Commission on the Status of Women, March 1st, 2012. I'm taking my picture for my ID and my phone is just buzzing. So when I finished, well, I looked down and I saw that at least, I can't think of her last name, had texted me and said, call ASAP, Breitbart died. My first thought was, I wonder who killed him. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was such an awful person. Um, but a lot of the, I, I had sued him, excuse me, and my lawyers wanted me to do this statement that I couldn't go along with. And even with all of that, I couldn't, I didn't want to be happy that he died. You know, that, that just wasn't me. And finally, the lawyers, they threatened to quit the case and all, because they wanted to, I can't even remember what their statement was about, but mine was, you know, my heart goes out to his children. I know what it is to lose a father at a young age, mm -hmm. you know, and it was the right thing to do. Um, and I think they saw that later. But I, I um, so there, there was a, I had to do a deposition, y'all. I went, I had to go to his lawyer's well, actually it was Larry O'Connor because he had died, and the others, all these conservative people. I went into one room where we ate lunch and they had this huge map of the United States. I think it was a Gore who lost all but six states. Oh, you should see, they were so happy that they had a, the biggest map you wanna see of the states showing these little six that, uh, that Gore had won. But I had to deal with these conservative people. They. Um, his wife had to take his place in the lawsuit. Um, and I had been prepared. He, you know, he's really, really tough. But this woman who started out <laughs> the, with the deposition, you know, I, I, for the first 15 minutes, I was a little nervous. But then I just played with her. Because she had tried to find three different ways to ask me the same question. <laughs> and I say, I answered that. What is it you want me to say? You know, so I just messed with her mind all day long. And <laughs> so she, w and then they, they didn't even know about New Communities receiving the award in the Pickford case until after they sued, I mean, after they went after me. And that had nothing to do with what he did to me, but they tried to say I committed fraud with the Pickford case. We went through a more rigorous process with that claim than anybody else who filed one, you know? So nothing was done wrong there, but they tried. She kept trying to bring that in all day. <laughs> and um, so she didn't leave much room for this other lawyer who was really supposed to be tough. So just as he was really written ready to come after me, my lawyers jumped up and said, that's it. Seven hours I had done 
you know, and, um, and they tried to argue for more time. They sent me out and finally that woman who was one of those conservative lawyers came out and shook my hand and said, it's over, <laughs> you know. Hmm. But uh, you can't give up even, I mean, well, I, I've given a deposition, I guess, before, but seven hours wow. where they are drilling you and, and going after you and you just have to be, that's why you can't lose focus right. on what you have to do. Like I said, I started playing with the lady. I'm like, what do you want me to say? You know, you tell me and I'll say it. <laughs> you know, I'm messing with her. And she knew that was the wrong thing, but all that became part of the deposition. Right. You know? <laughs> yes. But don't, you know, hang in there. Mm -hmm. Whatever you're trying to do, if it's good, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Sometime it'll take years. Mm -hmm. But if you stay true to what you're trying to do, it's going to eventually happen. You'll pull others to your side. But you have to stay true to your principles and the things you should be trying to accomplish. And don't try to do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. It takes everyone playing their part, their role, to try to make good things happen. Now, if it's bad, hey, you get all kind of folks coming to your side. But stay true to what you're trying to do and, and, and pray, and God will help you. You know, I've been able to work on some things for years, and then all of a sudden it happens, you know. Well, Shirley, thank you so much. Oh. It has been an honor to spend an afternoon with you, and thank you for sharing your life, advice, thoughts, all of this thank you. <laughs> with us. Um, can we get a round of applause for Shirley? <laughs> Shirley will now be available to sign copies.